the let's see the most optimistic I can imagine commercial cellulosic ethanol production it will take at least 36 hours and it may take substantially more than that in the near term and your fermenters as you personally told me actually hi me so I have many teachers and here's one um, you don't want solids in there okay we have inescapable solids because they're residue so there are many kinds of synergies but there's some places you don't look for synergies and in my opinion you will build new cellulosic fermenters I don't think you're going to use the fermenters you have now in order to process cellulosic biomass I agree that that's a good point and actually we have to to make this on our calculations for economic value in the, the final in the final ethanol so in this regard about prices and support for for the production we have these two uh, guys in, in in my left okay so I'd like to uh, first Brito to comment on the the policies that Michael showed us how complex they are uh, and in Brazil we have almost no policies for ethanol or advanced biofuels if you please could comment on this and how, what is your perspective on policies not only on the scientific uh, side uh, well, you're right. There are. It's not that there aren't policies in Brazil. There are, but the policies in Brazil never took too much care of the quality of the fuel of its performance. They took care of creating conditions for a large production and for a large uh, substitution of gasoline by uh, for uh, of ethanol for gasoline. So a Brazilian biofuel policy was much more oriented towards this, uh, the substitution than oriented towards uh, the envir environmental uh, portions of the problem. And now I believe that Brazil is going to change that because the world is going to have Brazil change that. Unless Brazil wants to remain isolated from the world and producing ethanol for itself, then we don't have to worry about what the world is thinking about that. But if Brazil wants to produce ethanol and sell it to some countries in the world, we will need to improve a lot our understanding of the environmental, social impacts of, of producing ethanol, and we will need to have appropriate policies to deal with that. That's why our program at FAPESP has the fifth division, which exactly tends to deal with that. And one example, as I mentioned, was that case of demonstrating that sugarcane ethanol can fit into the one of the buckets that Michael has shown in his slide, which is the advanced biofuels bucket. It's not something that you just make some hand-waving arguments and people believe it's an advanced biofuel. It's actually an engineering and scientific endeavor to demonstrate that your energy balance is decent, that your environmental impact is controlled, and that your, your molecule, your feedstock, and your, your whole operation fits within what the United States defined as advanced biofuel. So it's a whole new ball game for Brazil. And we have to hurry in adapting to that, because Brazil does not exist separated from the world. Michael, would you please uh, uh, comment on this and also say us something about the scientific support for advanced biofuels in, in the United States, USDA and USDOE, okay? Sure. Well, let me segue off what he said. I want to build on what, he, what, uh, what my colleague here just said. First of all, we have a set of policies on the book, legislative policies, that were born out of 20 years ago. They were born out of um, a desire to try to do rural development and to try to support an agricultural policy. So the original ethanol policies that were done were done for different reasons than energy and environment. That's how they came about. We've now moved, we've transformed. First thing I would caution, any U.S. legislator or any Brazilian legislator is solving something only for the state of Iowa is not long-term economically smart. We have to build a policy set that works across the hemisphere and works together because whether America likes it or not, there are certain places in the world that will be able to grow in the short and medium term feedstocks more abundantly 
that are more aligned with the policy objectives of the people of the world to deliver clean fuels and back out crude. So when you step back at a macro level, if you get a chance to have an intellectually rational conversation with a member of Congress, that means you didn't do it in a hearing, um, then you talk about what are the performance objectives of the United States? What are the policy objectives? And if it's to back out foreign oil, then having an energy density requirement in the tax code would make sense. If it's to create efficient processes, then having a metric that rewarded efficient performance would make sense. If it were to deliver greenhouse gas reductions, then having a tax credit for, say, just for example, hypothetically, that was 10 cents that gave two cents for the guy that delivered 20% reduction and eight cents for the guy that delivered 80% reduction would make sense. Our current law doesn't do that. And so to your last point, what you see is you see a number of stakeholder groups that are beginning to latch on to this. And the irony is, is that the fiscal conservatives who were just elected in Congress last November, they don't care what the reason is, they want to constrain the federal spend so they're looking to shrink the current credits or subsidies or what have you, the special treatment would, would be their nomenclature, okay? And so then they want to move to a more technology neutral, performance driven policy that doesn't segment tax credits for biomass electricity versus tax credits for biomass based fuels versus solar versus wind versus geothermal, but creates a national framework of objectives that move in the direction. Last, last thing, and so you see the Union of Concerned Scientists, you see the Natural Resources Defense Council, you see the USDA, you see uh, a lot of the scientific community, a lot of the academic community actively participating in this debate about what is sustainability, how, would, how are the metrics that you would do to del deliver it, and now you see the policymakers beginning the real hard work of saying if you wipe out a lot of these lineaged 30-year provisions, how do you replace them and how do you create the greatest good for the greatest number? Very good, Michael. So I think if, if one of the panelists want to make one question to other panelists, we have the opportunity now. Otherwise, I will open to... Okay. Pessoal do suporte tem... Okay. Então, por favor, da audiência quiser fazer uma pergunta rápida, tem, temos uma pergunta aqui à esquerda. Por favor, se identifique e faça a pergunta é, curta, por favor. Uh, my name is Isadia, I work for uh, Prozin uh, uh, Biosolutions. I have two questions, actually. Um, unfortunately, it's not uh, short, but uh, let's try. Uh, first of all, we are discussing uh, etanose and cellulose. <laughs> and we are seeing that um, for the first time ever Brazil imported uh, ethanol. You know, the biggest country in the world importing ethanol. And just because the fleet of, of cars, new cars, flex cars, are growing uh, too much, and I don't think that the current ethanol production, first generation or Second generation will not respond that that address that needs in the short terms. So, reading the newspapers and uh, listening to some specialists, there will be a shortage of fuel, gasoline because alcohol is used in, on gasoline as well. So, <clears throat> what what would be the answer to to that uh, challenge? On the other side, I see that. Uh, the presenters uh, show big challenge, big technological challenge to go to ethanol second generation, pre-treatment, fermentation, and that's just a crazy idea. But why don't we combine in, uh, this uh, beautiful alliance in the United States and Brazil, and we do a combination of first generation of the United States and first generation of sugar cane, right? <clears throat> because also uh, we use this one sugar cane, $500 million investments, and we use that plant only for 180 days or 200 days. So 
have you have you thought about or anybody has idea that we could produce the flax uh, ethanol production using corn, cassava, or any other source of starch? Uh, Norbert, você gostaria de responder? Ele falou a respeito da possibilidade de usar milácios e, e cana ao mesmo tempo e estender o período de safra e qual que é o, digamos, como que a gente vai superar esse problema de falta de álcool? O problema da, da, da falta de álcool, né? acho que nós vamos superar no que a gente tem conversado muito aqui nesse evento, no Etanol Summit, que é a, a verticalização da produção. Né? Nós temos hoje uma produtividade agrícola que foi desenvolvida e, foi, e se entende que ela é nós temos uma alta produtividade, mas essa produtividade ainda tem desafios e ela ainda pode ser melhorada. Né? Isso na primeira parte da cadeia, na base da cadeia. Depois nós também podemos ter variedades de cana com uma quantidade maior de açúcar, uma disponibilidade maior de açúcar para ser hidrolisado, ser fermentado, etc. Né? E quanto à produção conjunta, eu vou pensar nisso, mas o que eu aprendi até agora é que esses amiláceos, e esses materiais lignos celulósicos, eles precisam de tratamento diferenciados para se produzir etanol. E é por isso que, o, que o, por exemplo, se produz de milho com processo produtivo de, de cana-de-açúcar. E se teve separação de sólidos, por, por exemplo, em diferentes fases, etc. Né? Destilação é diferente. Mas uh, sempre uma nova ideia é uma boa ideia. Quem trabalha com desenvolvimento tecnológico sempre tem que pensar em, nesse tipo de desafio. Mas eu diria que, eu diria que o, a verticalização da produção, né, a gente ter mais, mais etanol por, por hectare é, é o desafio que nos coloca aí para vencer essa falta de etanol. Guido, wants to add something. Uh, I think the answer is in the numbers. In the United States, the forecast increase is going from 12 million, billion gallons to 37 billion gallons. Multiplied by three grossly is another 70 million tons of ethanol, and in Brazil, doubling the capacity. So you have to add 100 million tons of ethanol. In my numbers, this is 200 million tons of sugars. There's no way sugar cane, if you produce with sugar, is the most efficient way to produce sugar. There's no way you can have cassava or other stuff to produce hundreds of millions of tons of sugar. But if you go cellulosic, then you, com you, you compound the sugar you can make on sugar cane with the rest, with the residual part. So there is only 20%, 25% sugar in the sugar cane. The other 75% can be used, well, what is done, water, can be used to produce, uh, to produce ethanol. But the numbers are so big that you, Brazil is already the most efficient by far in producing ethanol in terms of quantity per hectare. Six tons, seven tons per hectare with sugar cane. If you go down to cassava, you go down to two tons, One and a half tons, not enough. Not enough actors in the world. Okay, let's proceed. We have another question here. Claudine Andrioli. Claudine Andrioli, President of the Sociedade Ibero-Americana for the Development of Biorefinarias. Suponhamos que tenhamos hoje tecnologia pronta de etanol de celulose, sem risco de investimentos para os empresários, qual seria a demanda, no caso, falando no caso do Brasil, de bagaço de cana necessário? E coloco agora. Hoje a usina no estado de São Paulo utiliza praticamente 80% do bagaço para rodar suas próprias energias e vapor para tocar a usina. Apenas 3 a 4% do bagaço ainda hoje, por causa disso, da ineficiência da termos das, das caldeiras, você não tem bagaço suficiente para 